Hey, Paradise people. Welcome back to the podcast and our radio sh- show here at Bobo 89.1 FM. I'm Bella Rooney, your host, and today we are joined with the brilliant, the fabulous Kathy Childs. Yay! It's long overdue to have you in here and to be chatting to you about this. So we're, you taught me environmental science at UCCI, which... Well, I was getting my associate's degree, which I mean, quite literally just kind of transformed my life. Like, you know, no pressure, but it did. You just taught it so well and it made me understand all the different aspects of environmental oh my science. Gosh, you're so kind. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> really, honestly. And I'm sure there are other kids that felt the exact same way in that class. So thank you so much for coming to talk to us today about climate heritage. It's my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> okay. So other than being like a superhero, you are also an environmental programs manager at the Cayman National Trust. You're also an island innovation ambassador with Island Innovation. And you hold a master's degree in environmental science with specialization in climate change and have a keen interest in climate-based solutions. So much so that you've created a carbon offset initiative that benefits local communities through protection of mangrove forests and funding of solar energy installations in schools. So literally hero material. (laughs) literally hero (laughs) material Kathy so I know some of your stories because we went to COP27 we've always chatted I love chatting so I want everybody else to get to know you a little bit better so why are you so passionate about climate change and how did you end up where you are now oh wow (laughs) oh well well, my undergraduate degree is in wildlife ecology because I just love nature and animals and Mm -hmm. so that seemed like a fun thing to study and it was it was fantastic yeah but most people who do that go into you know well, any, anybody going further in their studies usually gets more specialized. Mm. But I just became more interested in more things. You say that's kind of going like this. <laughs> exactly. like so I went into environmental science and learned about environmental geology and environmental chemistry, environmental bio- wow. biology. And then when I learned about climate change, I mean, that's even, that's the whole Broader. planet, right? So yeah. it was, I just found that really fascinating. And I also felt, I think, a personal obligation to do something about it because mm. people from my generation really are responsible for a lot of the problem. I mean, you can make the argument that people older than me maybe didn't realize what they were doing. Mm -hmm. But people in my generation knew full well, Mm. and we've done little to change the situation at all. Mm. And then my children and and people coming up are going to have to deal with this. So I think that it is only right Mm. that I get involved to do something, to to deal with it, to do Mm -hmm. something about it. I mean, there's a there's a quote that I, ever since I read it, it's really resonated with me by Alice Walker, where she says something like, I'm going to get it wrong, but <laughs> activism is my rent for living on the planet. Oh, I like that. Mm. That's so true. Right. It is, because you're like an earth steward, right? We all have to do our part. We're all taking up space and taking up resources. I think yeah. that we all really need to do what we can to leave the world a little better than we found it, if possible. Right. So, anyway, and not only that, but I just find the work really rewarding. It is. You could probably it? tell when I was... A teacher. Oh, yeah. I just think it's super fun. Yeah, you were always so much fun. I mean, ridiculously <laughs> fun. I was like, she loves it. It made me love it. Yeah, so it's not so selfless when I'm loving it so much, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, I really enjoy it as well. It's really rewarding. Well, that's wonderful. And I mean, everybody listen to that. And, you know, take notes because I agree fully with you. So, like I said, we attended COP27 together in Egypt. This And this was the first time that the parties of the UN, so the United Nations, um, the, at the climate convention, recognize the critical linkages between cultural heritage and climate change. So there might be people out there going, what? There are links? Because that was my original reaction. I was like, wait, there are links between cultural heritage and climate change? They're linked? So, okay, culture and climate, <clears throat> how are these two things related? Let's just start with that. Okay. Well, I think everybody probably can see the most obvious things, which are certain bits of our cultural heritage around the world are going to be lost because of climate change. Right. Right. Certain certain things that are too close to the sea will be lost to sea level rise. Right. Certain um, other historic places might get lost to, to the stronger storms we're expected to experience. For example, apparently the Statue of Liberty took a really hard hit when Superstorm Sandy hit New York City, Did for it? example. Yeah. You know, and then other places like the Marshall Islands are expected to lose a lot of their land to sea level rise as well. So there's, I think people can imagine losing things, but I don't think that people really realize how important culture and heritage is to actually addressing the climate crisis as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's all wrapped up in there. I mean, 
if you look at the Paris Agreement and the in the four things that they put forward as as areas that we need to work on, which mm-hmm. is mitigation or slowing climate change by stopping doing all the things that we're doing to add to it, like we need to decarbonize our society, we need to mm-hmm. stop cutting down all the trees. Mm-hmm. Well, if we look at how we do that, it has that has a big sort of cultural focus as well. So. Um, Societies that value mm-hmm. nature mm-hmm. more than many other societies around the world. Um, also, looking at um, other ways to to make power and to to work as a society that doesn't involve fossil fuels, fossil fuels. for example. Mm-hmm. Um, also, Paris Agreement said that we need to look at adaptation. There's mm-hmm. certain things we're not going to be able to stop. So, how are we going to adapt? How are we going to change and be ready for those things? So, there's ways too that as a local place, um, we have more knowledge about our area than people come from other places. Right. So in the past, it might be experts from Europe or the United States would say, okay, you over here in this country, this is what you're going to expect, and these are the best ways for you to address those problems. Right. But, and they they might be super great experts and and have all of the the best knowledge in their heads and on their computers, but they don't have that intergenerational that that generational knowledge that's passed down exactly right. of living in that place and what right. those people have seen in mm-hmm. the past and what's going to happen like on a micro level right like i know that if a storm passes this way that this particular area is going to be hit in this way and this is what i need to do to be prepared for that and this is what my my grandparents did when they expected this to happen and sure things are going to be storms are going to be stronger Mm-hmm. And we'll have longer droughts and we'll have bigger, you know, rainfall events. Mm-hmm. But listening to what people are saying on the ground is really important because those people have a much more intimate knowledge of their of their areas than anybody, any expert coming from somewhere else Anywhere would else. ever have. Right, of course, which makes logical sense. Yes, and they've actually now added this um, idea. It's called LLA, which is local, locally led adaptation. Oh, okay. Yeah, because they're finally realizing that. Hang on, that people that we should give a little more respect to people on the ground in their actual homes, mm-hmm. homelands, yeah. that they might have some knowledge too about where they live. So yeah. that's that, that's another thing. And then um, loss and damage. So yes, I have a certain, question about that. Mm-hmm. There are certain things that we're not going to be able to save. Right. I mean, we've just waited too long to stop climate change completely. Certain mm-hmm. things are going to be happening, mm-hmm. as we've seen already. Mm-hmm. So the people in the culture and heritage space are going to be the ones that are going to have to be helping societies deal with that. What things need to be saved? Do, do we archive some things? Do we move some things to, to, to keep them where, you know, part of our culture and heritage? And what happens to those societies that have to move completely? You know, how do it's we massive. keep those societies together cohesive as a community if they have to leave their homeland and immigrate somewhere else you don't want to completely lose your whole feeling of of who you are as a culture yeah right so it's important to to have these other voices um be part of the conversation about about climate change as well so and and then the other thing the last thing with the paris agreement the fourth thing is um empowerment and education and awareness and of course, that's all down to, to people on the ground, cultural actors like teachers and artists and musicians. Mm-hmm. They all mm-hmm. can spread the message because, let's face it, graphs and pie charts and numbers and things don't resonate in everybody's brain, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes a really amazing painting or, or a um, performance mm-hmm. might hit people mm-hmm. where it, you know, in a more um, impactful way mm-hmm. than any scientific paper ever could. Well, it's a very special way of communicating the issue, right? Because mm-hmm. that's a whole other topic is, is how culture, how we can use culture to actually communicate our climate crisis. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, those voices have not really been part of the conversation. So far, right? right. The, the technological mm-hmm. players that kind of got us into this situation in the first place are now the ones that are trying to get us out of it. They're looking at really te- technolo- technological solutions. Mm-hmm. And those are really great and important. But so far, I think everybody would agree, scientists would for sure, that we have really failed when it comes to addressing the climate emergency. Mm. The numbers are still going up, even though we keep having these meetings every year where everybody gets together and they say what we should do. You know, it's yeah. we're not really making a significant difference. Right. It needs to go a lot faster. So what's why is it failing? What's, what's the problem? And actually, climate scientists are saying, 
we need to have everybody's voices included here. Mm -hmm. Not just the scientists, not just the politicians, mm -hmm. but regular people mm -hmm. who can represent their societies and take it back home to, to talk to the people mm -hmm. in a way that resonates with them mm -hmm. about the situation and make changes on the ground at the local level. Right, and I guess actually that leads into this question of our culture here in Cayman, what do you think would be some of the threats to our culture here with climate change? Well, I mean, yeah. we have maritime heritage, Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Just massive. We rely on the sea so much. We always have. Our mangroves, I don't know much about our heritage with our mangroves. Well, our heritage is a big, it's a big idea. It is. Right? right. Cultural heritage is not just about buildings, for example. Right. right? It, it's not just about, um, it, it's, it's, it's the, it's about cassava cake. It's right. about cat mm -hmm. boats. It's about, you know, uh, yeah. the local dialect. It's about, you know, and nature. Where, mm -hmm. where you used to go swimming with your family when you were a child or where mm -hmm. you went fishing with your grandfather or, you know, these places that we think of as part of who we are as a people mm -hmm. is really important to sort of keep that sense of community mm -hmm. and um, resonating with... Um, who we are mm -hmm. and and feeling like like these people are Kamanians. We're, we're part of a community. We're working together to, mm -hmm. to look after our homeland, right? So the, losing those natural areas yeah. impacts us like losing a cathedral might, you know, to people wow. in, in yeah. Europe, yeah. right? Yeah. We might not have, we have some amazing historic structures that need to be preserved, mm -hmm. but we have more than that. We have these amazing natural areas also that are really important to look after because mm -hmm. if we don't have those, then we lose a big part of who we are. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all of that. It's it's historic things that we've always done as a people, mm -hmm. you know, the fishing, the sailing, the mm -hmm. um, building these amazing buildings and and speaking to each other the way people do mm -hmm. and um, families that are united the way they are, mm -hmm. all that's really important. And then the natural areas and maintaining them, the integrity of those areas, because that's what makes, you know, the fish be where they need to be on the reef. You know, that's so what balanced. supports our, it, so much so. It supports the tourism industry, the fact that you've got those mangroves there. Right. It's also interconnected. Right. I didn't even think about that, of course, because if we were to lose if climate change were to somehow impact our mangroves or if anything we were to do, like maybe this east-west RTO bypass, if we were to do anything like that that could possibly impact the mangroves that has then oh, an effect on our fish and that then affects our culture. I didn't even, that's so linked. It's so linked. And then the coral reefs, of course, are so important to protect us from storms as well as the mangroves. Yeah. And the, the coral reefs are affected by ocean acidification, which is another part of the whole climate uh -huh. thing, right? So it's um, multifaceted and so interconnected. Right, okay. So this year, thankfully, we did have a good, you know, a pretty massive breakthrough with COP27 where we had the approval of the loss and damage fund, right? Um, so I just wondered if you might explain a bit more about what that is to people and um, maybe what does that mean in the context of culture and heritage? Okay, sure. So the loss and damage question was yeah. something that they were really, they've been working on for a while, and they were really hoping to get it done for COP27, and they did it like at the 13th hour. They, they finally got something <laughs> written in there. Um, and what it means is there are going to be certain things, as I mentioned before, certain things about that's going to affect us from climate change that we're not going to be able to stop right. from happening, right? right. And um, so, ad and we can't adapt to. So adaptation helps us to deal with those effects right. but beyond that that would be what loss and damage would address okay and um it's been something that's been pretty controversial because what the vulnerable countries of the world including small island states and other countries that are going to be the most affected by climate change what they were saying is you countries that cause this problem mm. need to help us mm. deal with the problem now, which seems fair. Seems accountability. Right? right? It's a mm -hmm. climate justice issue. Mm -hmm. You guys have made tons of money off mm -hmm. of um, this Petro world that you've created. Mm -hmm. So now you really need to help us out to, as far as dealing with the effects of this problem that you created. Right? right. Meanwhile, those developed countries are like, uh, 
Mm. This sounds a lot like taking liability for a huge problem. <laughs> it's going to be um, mm. really expensive, and we don't want to accept liability for for people losing, in some cases, their perhaps their entire country. Right. You know, oh. that's something that we can't accept. And not only that, but even though the United States is the historical emitter mm -hmm. and has the most carbon in the atmosphere to date mm -hmm. because of historic emissions, mm -hmm. China has passed it now. Right. So the U.S. is like, hey, China needs to be part of this too. And China was like, well, we're still not, you know, we're still developing officially mm. and that's maybe we <laughs> don't need to be part of that. So there's been this debate back and forth. Mm. So anyway, China now has come on board and said, okay, we'll get involved with the loss and damage fund. Maybe not with uh, actual um, money, but with other supports. Mm -hmm. We don't know what that means yet. But mm -hmm. if if that happens, and it's not going to be an easy out for mm -hmm. the United States and Australia and others that were sort of dragging their heels mm -hmm. on this. Um, but many, many European countries um, have been all on board with it. Right. And and then, and then, as I said, on the 13th hour, they just, they did put the language in the agreement, mm. and they will flesh out the details at COP28, exactly what it will look like. But it's huge that it's in there now, because that was something that has been opposed by really powerful countries for a long time. So it's, it's a major milestone that that's there now. Right. What does that mean for, does that mean that this is money going back to the, I guess, indigenous communities to be able to preserve their culture, their lands, their livelihood, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, local communities around the world, so not just indigenous right, communities, right, right, right. But, but local communities as well. Yes, mm -hmm. it does mean that, that they'll, there'll be some help, some help for them right. to be able to deal with the situation. However, it should be mentioned that there's already a climate fund that was set up several years ago that they were pledged $100 billion a year to help communities around the world when was adapt. It, oh, it was a few years ago at one of the cops, Another? but it hasn't. Oh, my goodness. It's never been, that money has never, there's been some, but not what they pledged. Not as much, that's a yeah. lot of money. So what I'm saying is don't hold your breath. Oh, <laughs> no. That's but, always the issue, isn't it, with these things? It's, it takes a while. But, you know, it does show that there is movement in that direction, which is, you know, I don't want to mm -hmm. cut that down at all because it's really important. Mm -hmm. It's a stepping process, right? And we've got, we've got the language in there now. Mm -hmm. And then next year, they'll talk about exactly what it means and who will give what. Mm -hmm. And there'll be pledges. And then maybe it'll take a little while for that money to actually get there. But it will get there. Mm -hmm. um, the trouble is the climate catastrophe is going way faster than we're dealing with it. I mean, <laughs> I, the thing is, when you see something like COVID-19 happen, how quickly the world can immobilize and put money towards saving lives you know it, it makes you go this is almost a greater threat and somehow we can't immobilize fast enough for it yeah it's way it's a way bigger threat it's actually yeah we need to do something about it you yesterday know? <laughs> you know <laughs> and sure. i mean it affects my kids it affects mm. your kids it's kids <laughs> kids it's kids that's not right but you know it's it's like a, so much it's a long generational issue and 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 it blows my mind that we can't just like yeah and the reason why that's that affects culture and heritage, which yeah. is what you asked, is because that's what's at risk. Yeah, exactly. You know, people, whole cultures could be lost. There, there are, you know, endangered cultures around the world who who could lose their homeland, and then it's really difficult to, to keep that together if you have to immigrate to another place. Well, that's the other thing. What's that? That's called climate immigration or mm -hmm. is that what it's called yeah, yeah. The climate refugees climate refuge climate re that's it climate refugees because that's going to become a, a thing yeah and it's already started to be talked about in the pacific and australia has pledged to take in some but um there's also an initiative there called the rising seas initiative where they're okay. saying it's it's kind of heartbreaking to think about actually but they're saying look we want the eezs the um economic zones around our islands yeah. to be to be cemented in place right now because if we lose our islands, we don't want to lose our Everything. our our areas. Yeah. Because we still want to have access to those resources. We still want that to be our our mm -hmm. homeland, even if there's no land above the water. Mm -hmm. And there's there's people who are, who have already said, "Look, I'm not leaving. Mm -hmm. This is my homeland. I'm mm -hmm. not going anywhere." We're you know humans are ingenious. We'll come up with some sort of floating arrangement or something. But floating I'm staying. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine having to have that discussion it's about horrifying. okay when my Whole country goes underwater. I want the United Nations to still recognize us as a country and still recognize our economic zones. That's crazy, right? It's, so those well, conversations are happening. Well, it's crazy because it's almost, I feel like people can't see it. 
because you can't see it happening, you think it's not happening. I mean, here in Cayman, I mean, I don't think we've had a significant sea level rise, have we? Like significant enough for us to be like, oh my God, you know, we're going to lose something. <laughs> but I know when we were at COP, we met people from areas in the Pacific Islands who did a short, uh, they did, well, I'll have to find links for that so that people can watch it. But it was Conservation International. They did short movies on how the 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 climate change is affecting their islands and, and the waves and the currents and everything, right? That was what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. That was really interesting. And that reminds me of another, I'll have to give you the link so you can share it, but there's this really cool piece that was done by these um, two women, one from the Marshall Islands and mm-hmm. another from Greenland. Mm-hmm. And they did something together mm-hmm. as, it was really beautiful because it was these different cultures coming together to represent um, indigenous communities around the world wow. that are losing their homelands. So the Marshall Islands, because they're so low-lying, they're you know, they're losing land every day. Right. And then Greenland's losing all of their ice. Right. So these two women came together and talked about the experience of what that means and wrote um, a little song that they did. Mm. And it was really, really, really impactful. Wow. So that is an example of how culture mm-hmm. can really sort of flip the conversation. Mm-hmm. Because the, what um, the Climate Heritage Network has, they sat down for a long time by the way, the National Trust mm-hmm. of the Cayman Islands is part of the Climate Heritage Network, which is this international group of organizations mm-hmm. around the world that are looking at how culture and heritage can better inform the climate um, debate and mm-hmm. and um, and how that should be done. So they had a sort of a visioning exercise, and and what they decided that the, their what they could really contribute to the conversation, the climate conversation, is um, bringing these voices to the forefront because this is how we can help people to imagine a a world beyond carbon Mm -hmm. because we really it's it's hard for people to think about anything but what they've experienced but it wasn't that long ago when people didn't weren't addicted to oil this is actually pretty recent i mean Mm. our grandparents saved everything and reused them right they didn't have to have a brand new something every couple of years of like we do now. No, no <laughs> brand new iPhones, laptops, right. yeah. So it's it's uh, it's understanding that that wasn't that long ago. Mm-hmm. Plastics have only been around since the 50s. I mean, it's not, yeah. we don't have to really think about to be that imaginative to know how we can move forward in a way that we can keep our standard of living. Yeah. Right? Nobody wants to go back to caveman days. That's not what I'm saying. I'm right. saying let's just think about the quality of our life yeah. in a way that isn't so extractive and exploitive. Yeah. Do you think some of... I cause This is this is my personal opinion, kind of. I've always... I've been cultivating this idea for a while now. I kind of think my generation or maybe, maybe the generation just below me as well, we've kind of, because there's so much accessibility to TV shows, to movies, to your iPhone, to TikTok, to Instagram so much accessibility on our phones that we forget to put them down and look at everything around us and feel connected to that. And when we lose that connection to what's around us, we completely lose kind of sight of that we have responsibilities to it. You know, I, I that's kind of how I feel, which is what you're kind of just mentioning, that we've come so far, so like as a, as a population, as a human race, this race has come so far, but we, we need to move forward in a backwards manner. It's kind of how I see it, you know? Like, we, we have, we could do so much with what we have already that's already on this earth in terms of products and, and ideas and everything. And we just, we don't harness our relationship with our culture to think about how we could, like, bring those things back into our everyday lives and maybe push out simple things like water bottles, like really simple things. So it's just... That's just my idea. <laughs> but I mean, Absolutely. That's yeah. that's so well said. You didn't need me here today. Oh, oh my God. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> that was really well said, though. And I wouldn't say just your generation. I think mm. we're all guilty of that, sitting in front of the TV or, or phones and mm. not engaging with the people around us as much as we should and not appreciating what's outside of our windows. And I think that at least that was something that the COVID um, experience did for a lot of people around the world is they appreciated mm-hmm. nature. And they were like, oh, my God, have birds always been outside my window? Singing so loudly, it seems Such like... Such nice songs. <laughs> I know. Like, and they just, just, for the first time, sometimes appreciated yeah. the nature that was right there all along. Mm-hmm. And I think that we all hope to come back as mm-hmm. better people mm-hmm. and as better societies. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that happened, which is, you know, I, I think that there's, we mm-hmm. still need to work on that, mm-hmm. you know, to build back better, as as we all said. Yeah. And um, because 
I think it's easy if you're an urban or suburban person mm-hmm. to feel like that you live independently of nature. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't really need it. Mm-hmm. And it's important to understand that, in fact, we do, right? That's our food is pollinated by by bees and bats and things mm-hmm. and butterflies. And um, rainfall is mm-hmm. comes from natural areas that create the evapotranspiration that mm-hmm. cause the, you know, the rainfall to mm-hmm. actually occur. Mm-hmm. It, like if we didn't have our mangroves in the middle of the island, a huge portion of the rain that we experience on the western side of the island wouldn't wouldn't happen because those mangroves mm-hmm. cause the rain, right? They, right? they make their own rain. Well, they, people know that about the Amazon, but you might not know what happens right here in Cayman as I well. I know, which is so cool. <laughs> I know. I mean, we have our own little mini ecosystem, like little, like little, it's so, it's so cool. Yeah, it's so threatened at the same time. It's kind of crazy. Um, okay, well, this, this kind of leads into one of the questions. So I was reading around trying to think of interesting questions to ask you about this because, you know, it's, it all kind of is in the same kind of genre of speaking. Like you could can't answer a lot of questions with the same answers. Um, but I found, I found a round meeting, round table meeting done by, okay, I'm going to try and say it in Italian. Fondazione, so, oh God, Scuola Bene Culturale, which I think is just um, the Cultural Heritage Foundation <laughs> in Italy. <laughs> that was impressive. Uh, thank you. I practiced it all morning with Google Translate. But, um, our friend Andrew Potts, he actually, he's from the Climate Heritage Network, and he actually, I think, wrote the introduction to this paper. So one of the questions I thought was really interesting, and it kind of touches on emotions and how we can start portraying these, you know, you have your scientific world and then you have your emotional world and how you can use both of these to get across the issue of climate change because the statistics are just not it. So the question is, most awareness raising activities on climate change have been entrusted to statistical data that can only be processed by our cognitive sphere. In order to change behaviors, it could, however, be necessary to involve the emotional sphere. What what role can culture have in this emotion, uh, in respect, and how can it contribute to building an imaginary, an imagery, sorry, imagery of possible futures in a world touched by climate change? So the question is about whether data is enough to move consciousness to change behaviors, or whether the emotional sphere needs to be taken into account in order to bring about climate change and that in the imagery for that as well i thought it was a very interesting question yeah because i feel like that's a big disconnect absolutely we just absolutely can't connect it and i think it's important to remember that when we talk about culture and heritage we're not talking about only things in the past right you know? yeah it's about who we are as a people now yeah. and and different occupations right as well so people who are artists and musicians and architects and uh, you know all these different people jobs and people who who aren't climate scientists right. have voices and they have ways of talking to people that are helpful and useful and as Andrew said that can sometimes speak to the other side of the brain and mm-hmm. and hit people in a way that that might not resonate with a lot of people um, and I think it I think that some of the the early work on and trying to reach people about climate change attempted to reach people in that way by mm. by going to people's emotions by talking about polar bears for example right like keystone species and exactly things. and the how tragic it is that they're you know losing their um ecosystems yeah and it, i think that, that was impactful but mm-hmm. it also it also doesn't touch on what people are going to experience in their own places it mm-hmm. makes it makes it sound like oh well that's really sad for the arctic oh well let me go about my daily life it's mm-hmm. not going to affect me right? right or it also is very depressing mm-hmm. and some people that just shuts people down it does it does so yeah. talking is about this beautiful future that we could build together yeah right by having those people who are good at imagining alternative universes mm-hmm. and where we could where we could be if we would mm-hmm. work together and um is is, is important and and I, I think the fact that climate scientists said we need to have these other people as part of the conversation says something, right? It does. I think so. They're humans in the end yeah. as well, right? And um, <laughs> <laughs> Even if they might not seem like humans, they're humans. <laughs> so it's, it's important to have those other voices and to reach people wherever they live, right? right? Yeah. Literally and figuratively. Literally and figuratively. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, there's... Where can people go to learn more about this? I mean, I know we have the, um, I would definitely recommend the Climate Heritage Network for sure. For um, sure. Where else do you recommend people kind of maybe start to try and dive more into this? That's a great question. The International National Trust Organization has mm-hmm. been working on um, including culture and heritage in the, in the climate 
um, space for even longer than the Climate Heritage Network has, mm -hmm. which they've acknowledged, which is kind of cool. So the um, so I would I would look at their website, mm -hmm. um, follow the Climate Heritage Network and what they're working on. They're they're working so hard. They're trying. You you, you mentioned how in COP uh, COP twenty seven they got the language finally in the mm -hmm. in the um, document, but what they're working on for COP twenty eight is to actually get it into the strategic. Um, points that are in there. So they, for example, on like how we're going to deal with climate change, there's, mm -hmm. they address transportation, they address livestock, they address, they want culture and heritage to be one of those line items that is addressed in um, climate, everything. the climate policies, right. which should be really cool. So that is what they're working on. So wow. it's this constant, um, constant stuff coming out with the Climate Heritage Network. They're so inspirational. So I would definitely uh, look more at that. And then, um, I'll share with you some of the links I told mm -hmm. you about as yes. well. There's a lot of interesting, interesting um, thoughts. And then just if you have something that you would like to share with the community, then please feel free to contact me as well mm -hmm. at the National Trust. I'm in environment at nationaltrust.org.ky or just call us. And I'll be happy to, to share what you have because, um, Again, I'm a trained scientist. I can't do the stuff that you do, Bella, for example, with your performance art and oh. everything. It's pretty impressive. Oh, thank you. Yes, <laughs> and, um, and or music. Like mm -hmm. my family loved the um, um, Reduce, Reuse, Recycle song by Jack Johnson. Do yeah, you know yeah, that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we grew up, my kids grew up with that song. Right. So it just shows you how sometimes, you know, even songs can completely. It becomes part of your family tradition. Exactly. It's crazy. It, you know, whereas a uh, pie chart's not doing that, right? Not so. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly. It just strikes fear in a lot of people. <laughs> so I think all of these things are so important, and I'm so glad that you invited me here today to talk more about how that's connected, because I think you're right. I think a lot of people really haven't thought about it from that perspective, about the kind of the human, people-centered um, approach to climate science, so mm -hmm. that we can make sure that there's a, um, a low carbon, just, and climate resilient future mm -hmm. for the people yeah. here in Cayman and around the world. We really need it here. You know, we need to be a leader in it here, I think, personally. It's my opinion. I think a lot of people would agree with that, though. We, we, we have such a great opportunity to be a leader in that and to show each other how much we love each other, be truly came and kind with each other and yes. actually show each other that in a way that makes the biggest difference. And we can. We can. Yes. Everybody out there, talk to your representative. Yeah. And tell them that you want to see these things happen because that's what it takes. If they know that you want it, then they will. Um, they're supposed to be your representative, right? That so, is the point. Exactly. <laughs> and it'll help get some of these things move forward. Well, thank you so much for coming in and chatting with me about this. It this is my like pleasure. A, this has felt like a normal little chat between us, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> which is quite nice. And it's such an important aspect of climate change that really needs more attention. So, um for anybody who wants to learn more, as we mentioned, join the Climate Heritage Network and check out their 2022 to 23 Climate Heritage Action Plan. It's pretty cool. Thanks again to Kathy. You are the best ever. Thanks for coming. You're so sweet. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Great. And thank you so much to DMS Broadcasting and Bobo 89.1 FM and our incredibly kind sponsors for this episode, which is Daniel, Caitlin, Sean, and Liz Harrington. Thanks, guys. We love the support. It makes a world of a difference. Thank you to my pal Ryan Kirkaldi for filming all of this and Retrospect Media. And check out our filmed episodes over on YouTube and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Protecting Paradise KY. You, if you are interested in sponsoring an episode, then you can also check out our fundraiser that we have going on Go Get Funding, uh, which is a website. You can just type in Protecting Paradise Podcast. We'll pop right up. And any support you give will just mean the world to us and allow us to keep doing what we're doing. So finally, you can't care unless you know. You really can't. So thanks for joining us today. And remember, we are always open to your opinion and topic suggestions. So don't be shy. And we'll see you next week. Toodles.